still remember the first time he showed me how to cast my line. His hands kept me steady as the cold mountain water rushed around my boots. Looking back on it, fishing with my grandfather in the eastern slopes, in the shadow of the Rocky Mountains, were the best moments I had growing up. Patience, strength, trust. I learned a lot from spending time in those streams. The streams in the east slopes are home to countless plants and animals, like Alberta's native trout. These special fish, the west slope cutthroat, bull, and Athabasca rainbow trout, hold the memories of our past and the potential for our future in their fins. The waters they swim in keep everything alive, including the people living in the eastern slopes or downstream who rely on these streams for drinking water. When I go back to those lush places my grandfather used to take me, I see changes. The eastern slopes are well-loved, but also heavily used. More activity over time has changed these lands and streams. Alberta's native trout are now gone from most streams, and the water that used to run cool, clean, clear, and connected is now overstressed, muddied, and disconnected. One day, I hope to bring my grandkids to these same places, to feel connected to these waters and these fish that my grandfather and I grew up with. We can still keep Alberta wild and bring back our trout. By keeping rivers and streams cold, clean, clear, and connected, we will get to enjoy Alberta's wilderness at its best for generations to come. Native trout are part of Alberta. Let's keep them here. Thanks for joining us at our 12th annual Native Trout Workshop, session number two for this year. So my name is Noreen Ambrose and um, I work with an organization called Cows and Fish. So I want to um, welcome everybody. Um, hopefully uh, you have some familiarity with Zoom and um, are familiar with some of the attributes of it. I'll cover some technical items in just a moment, but I want to uh, first thank, uh, thank you all again for attending and um, and we'll get started. I want to acknowledge the lands that we're on and in and particularly where I'm currently located is which is in Lethbridge. I, I, I want to acknowledge that I live work and play in Treaty 7 the ancestral traditional lands of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Siksika, the Kainai, the Pekani shared with the Satina, the Stony Dakota, and the for Métis Nations of Alberta. There are many others joining us across Alberta and other places I see in the chat. So please uh, take a moment to acknowledge um, where you're from. And I acknowledge that this work is intended to reach people in uh, traditional territories of Treaty 4, 6, 8, and 10 across Alberta. 
and many other First Nations, Métis and Inuit, whose footsteps have marked these lands for generations and since time immemorial. There's a long relationship of care and loving for the land that, uh, that we can learn a lot from to um, inform our use and connection to the landscape that we're on today. So I want to start that off. Um, by encouraging you to fill in the chat if you're interested in adding your own information there. So a few technical things. We have, as I said, this is session two. We have four presentations today. We'll have each presentation um, and then we'll have a shared panelist um, session at the end for questions. So there won't be questions after each presenter, but at the end as a group. So please put your questions in the Q&A box. And if you're, if you're not familiar that for most of you that will show up on the bottom of your screen and little be little bubbles that look like um, comment boxes and you can enter your question in there. And because um, we may get lots of questions, we also want you to go in there and vote. Basically, you can uplist or, or mark your favorite question. Say, yeah, I really want to hear about this question because um, it's really important to me. So even if you didn't put a question in, you can also uplist questions to ensure they get answered. Uh, if we run out of time, there'll be our priority questions to ask our panelists. If you want to have a conversation or just make a general comment, please use the chat function for that. Um, we won't be taking questions out of the chat function. Just uh, feel free to you know, add comments that you're interested in. For those of you that want to change your view, you can um, do this by going to the top of your screen and you have different view settings. You can um, basically change it to speaker view so that way the only the speaker that's speaking you'll see it or you can um, have gallery view which will show multiple presenters at once. So depending what you like. We'll be giving some prizes away after today's session. So everybody who's here today will be automatically added into that draw. And if you put a question in the Q&A session, you will also get an extra draw. So I encourage you to uh, participate to get that extra chance. The prizes are pretty awesome. $100 gift card to Cabela's, two different Patagonia fish themed ball caps, a Patagonia travel rod roll, a, gro a growler with a free fill and a hat, from Banded Peak Brewing in Calgary, two pair of tickets to the Bow Habitat Station, which is in Calgary, and a number of sticker packs from the Alberta Native Trout Collaborative. And we will email the, the winners because we have your email because you had to register with your email. So um, look for those opportunities to win. And we'll also be launching polls. Um, and the first one is going to come up actually right now. And that is to get a sense of who's attending today. So please um, take a moment and fill this in. This is really important for us to report to our funders um, uh, who came and, and what kind of audience we reached. So you can pick the best description for yourself. And um, in a, in a, after most of you have answered it, then we'll close it and we'll share the results. And you'll see that it sometimes stays on your screen after it's been closed. So you're, you'll need to just exit out if it's still on in front of your screen and in, in the way of you viewing the presenters. So um, if a few more of you could just fill it out, we'll close it momentarily. Almost most people have participated. So we'll just leave it up for a little bit longer. And while it's um, up, I'm going to encourage um, you all to, uh, again, participate during the session by using the chat and um, and just in, and, and get that kind of information to your to your colleagues, say hello, that kind of thing. So I think we'll close the poll and uh, Logan uh, will share the results. And so you can see that we have lots of folks who identify themselves as anglers. We have put quite a few people from non-government organizations and, and a host of, of uh, people in all the other categories as well. If you can't see them all, by the way, you can just scroll down on the side button. So thanks, Logan. That's great. So I just have to do the same thing. I just instructed each of you to do close that on my screen. So now if my slides will cooperate and move on to the next slide, they don't seem to want to just, we'll give it a little second here to wake itself up. So I mentioned that I work for an organization called Cows and Fish. Formerly our name is the Alberta Riparian Habitat Management Society. We are a registered um, charity, non -for not for profit. And our job is to help empower people who live, work, and play in riparian areas in Alberta to help connect those areas of land and water. That's the riparian. 
I often get asked what a cow has to do with fish. For me and for our organization, that means understanding the relationship of land and water, of land use and management and health ecosystems and the impact that our land uses and our activities have um, on, in this case, fish, which is what we're focusing on tonight and water more generally. It isn't just the relationship, of course, of cows or land and fish. There are a lot of human activities on our landscape that it can impact the land. And so that's part of what we want to talk about tonight, whether that's um, recreation or other kinds of sectors and industry using the land. Fish are, of course, a product of the water or sorry, aren't a product of the water. They are a product of the landscape and the whole watershed around them. The things that we do on land affect and flow downhill um, into water and waterways. And so we want to move past the roles of, you know, blaming and finding um, disconnect, but rather recognize that we all work together. We all live on this place and all are connected by water. So we want to find common solutions that, that benefit us all. And that's, um, livestock management, recreation, which is our focus tonight, um, having productive, healthy landscapes so that we can all benefit from them is really important. And riparian areas, those green threads along our water's edge, sow the land and the water together. They're that green connecting space of floodplains and stream banks. Healthy riparian areas are critical to provide clean, cold, connected, and complex waterways that support native trout, because that's what they require to survive. There um, are a lot of um, past images that might look a little bit like this, where Alberta's native trout and their habitat um, abundance are shown. It's a pretty special place, Alberta, and most of our native trout um, fall along the eastern slopes. But unfortunately, all of the native trout species in Alberta are currently listed as threatened uh, federally and provincially which means they are a species at risk. So they're confined to that narrow strip along the mountain's edges um, where these headwater streams are their last strongholds. And that isn't because there's any one reason, it's many, many reasons. All of the cumulative effects of things happening on the land and in the water that, um, that, that, are, that surround the water. So if we look at them and understand the lack of fish, uh, what does that tell us about our, our choices? Have we been good stewards of this shared place? The cumulative pressures of industry, forestry, grazing, recreation, population growth, angling, there's a lot of things that can be kind of overwhelming. Um, and so how do you focus recovery efforts? There is no one thing that's really important. It's all about those combined things. And so that's what our goal is tonight, is to talk about some of those things and how each of our different uh, relationships with native trout can be part of the solution. Working with a lot of things happening on the landscape uh, led us to um, become part of the Native Trout um, Collaborative in 2019. This um, is a group of organizations who you'll see here on this uh, slide, as well as other partners, to work together to identify recovery efforts that can bring back and slow the loss in some areas of Native Trout um, habitat and sort of begin to restore and understand. So we're working with funding from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, um, which is administered through our Environment and Protected, uh, sorry, new new acronym, Alberta Environment and Protected Areas, and um, and, a, and numerous other partners. And this event tonight is made possible by that funding, but also all of the partners you see on the list. So with that, I want to call up our first speaker, Megan Gowdy, and she's going to talk to us about recreation and invasive species management, specifically related to the national parks. So Megan is an aquatic biologist with Parks Canada, and she um, works in Lake Louise, Yoho and Kootenai field unit areas, living in Golden, BC. She's worked for several years in the environmental consulting industry in Alberta and BC before she joined uh, Parks Canada in 2016. She has had a lot of different experiences in aquatic ecosystem projects with Parks Canada in that time, working on restoration of native trout, water quality monitoring, aquatic invasive species monitoring and developing an aquatic stewardship plan for the Yoho and Kootenai National Parks. Over the past year, she's been coordinating efforts across five mountain parks to develop and implement a collaborative and comprehensive aquatic invasive species prevention program. So uh, welcome, Megan, and um, please uh, jump in. 
All right, thank you guys so much. Uh, thank you everybody for coming to the workshop today. And thank you cows and fish for having me um, on today to talk to you a little bit about what we're doing up in the Mountain National Parks for aquatic invasive species prevention. So um, I have a photo here uh, that just shows one of our students last year doing some aquatic invasive species monitoring. I'm not going to chat much about that today, but um, we have definitely ramped up our monitoring the mountain parks over the last few years. And so if anybody's interested in that, um, we can chat a little more later. Oh. Sorry, technical. There we go. Uh, so what I am going to talk uh, to you all about today um, I'll do a quick introduction to aquatic invasive species. Um, then I'll chat a little bit about the water recreation opportunities in the mountain national parks. And then um, I'll go and, and spend some time talking about the intersection of the two. Um, and that is really our mountain parks aquatic invasive species prevention program. The aquatic invasive species, I'm sure we've all seen some of these photos before, zebra mussels, whirling disease, fish, invertebrates, pathogens, plants that have been introduced into a new aquatic environment outside of their natural range. Once introduced, these aquatic invasive species can grow pretty rapidly because they don't necessarily have natural predators in their new environments. So as a result, uh, they can outcompete and harm native species. They can even alter habitats like the zebra mussel, for example, uh, to make them inhospitable for some native species. Uh, so this is particularly concerning in the headwaters um, because we have the species at risk uh, in the headwaters. And so we, we are quite concerned um, if, if we were to get the introduction of any of these species um, or how we're managing um, the species that we already have. So how are they introduced? Well, typically um, either unintentionally or intentionally. I'm gonna to focus today on that unintentional introduction of aquatic invasive species and that's through transfer on recreational equipment and gear. So any type of equipment, gear, watercraft, um, angling gear, that comes into contact with water, mud, or sediment from one water body with a known aquatic invasive species um, can easily trans be transferred then to the next water body that that person goes to um, if their gear or, or equipment isn't properly clean, drained, and dried. There's also that unintentional release uh, of, or sorry, that intentional release of um, aquatic invasive species. Um, and so this is something that Parks Canada has been dealing with through our um, historic stocking records of, of uh, non-native fish species for recreational purposes. Um, and then we do, we did have a, an occurrence of a northern crayfish um, there uh, in, in Bow, Bow uh, River this year. Um, and we were always sort of having that message of don't let it loose um, for those uh, aquarium type. Uh, pet releases. So again, I'm going to focus on that unintentional uh, release um, on recreational equipment and gear. Um, we have lots of recreational opportunities in the parks. Um, depending on the type of uh, equipment that you're using, be it a motorized watercraft or um, even just beach toys, there is some level of risk um, associated with that, that uh, transfer of water, mud, or sediment um, that could potentially can have aquatic invasive species from one water body to another, even within the mountain parks. And so there is some gradient of risk associated with uh, the different types of recreational equipment. For example, um, you know, you would think a beach toy um, would be a little lower risk than say fishing equipment, which would be a little lower risk still than, you know, that motorized watercraft. Um, within motorized watercraft, there are different complexities as well. And so basically, uh, if you think about something that um, has lots of nooks and crannies, is hard to dry or hard to clean, that's what you're going to have a, as more of a risky sort of type of equipment or watercraft um, that, can, that can more easily transport um, aquatic invasive species. So that's um, my little blurb about what aquatic invasive species are. So before I get any further, I just want to define when I'm talking about the Mountain National Parks, now you know Jasper National Park, Banff, uh, Yoho and Kootenai, which are actually on the British Columbia side of the border, and then Waterton Lakes National Park. If you look at this little map in the bottom left corner, you can see that we're right at the headwaters here along the Rocky Mountains. We have watersheds that go to all three oceans surrounding Canada uh, that start in these parks. So we have a really um, high sense of, of duty to um, ensure that we're preventing any introduction of aquatic invasive species because we are at the headwaters and, and it is a really special place. So what can you do in the water and the, in the mountain national parks in the water? Um, 
Well, if you think back to that risk uh, gradient and with the motorized watercraft being sort of the most risky, um, we actually have limited access to motorized watercraft in the Mountain National Parks. Um, in Jasper, Banff and Waterton, uh, they're the only parks um, that are actually you are allowed to have motorized watercraft. Um, and even then it is um, specific to very specific lakes. So in Jasper National Park, electric motors only. Um, in Moline, Medicine, Talbo, and Pyramid and Patricia Lakes only. In Banff National Park, gas and electric motors are allowed on Lake, Lake Minnewanka. And in Waterton Lakes National Park, gas and electric motors are allowed in Upper and Middle Waterton Lakes only. And Yoho and Kootenai National Parks, there are actually no lakes where motorized access is, is permitted. So we already have that sort of regulatory um, limitation on that higher risk motorized watercraft coming into national parks. So water uh, recreation in the Mount National Park, that doesn't just mean motorized watercraft as I'm sure any of you that have gone to Two Jack Lake on the weekend uh, may have noticed. Um, we have non-motorized watercraft. So that's kayaks, canoes, stand-up paddle boards, uh, even those like inflatable flamingos that we're seeing from time to time. Um, these are pretty much allowed every, everywhere in the Mountain National Parks with the exception of those water bodies that are closed for critical habitat for West Slope cutthroat trout. Similarly, most of our water bodies are open at some point or have open seasons um, for fishing. And uh, again, except for those water bodies that are closed um, for um, one reason or another, most prevalent being that West Slope cutthroat trout habitat. So um, we do allow quite a bit of movement in and around our water bodies, um, which is great because it's really fun to get out there. Um, some of these colder lakes, I don't know how people do it, um, but we're seeing lots and lots of recreation on our water bodies these days. So what are we doing to prevent aquatic invasive species in the mountain national parks? In 2021, we received funding um, in the five mountain national parks over five years to develop and implement an aquatic invasive species strategy. Admittedly, we are a little bit behind the provinces on the uh, aquatic invasive species prevention. Um, there have been inspection stations in the provinces for about a decade now. And so um, we're really trying to build on those programs within the park um, because we have that duty um, to, protect, to protect these places. Um, so there are four, three components of the, our aquatic invasive species strategy. There's prevention, early detection monitoring, rapid response and management. And I'm just gonna chat to you about the prevention component today. So Parks Canada is really ramping up in these three areas for, um, to help with that prevention message. We're increasing our, our levels of education, uh, both targeting folks before they come into the park, uh, while they're here, and then hopefully after they leave, they, they can um, have that sense of, of, of committing and, and uh, doing their part to um, protect the ecological integrity of aquatic, mesas, uh, of aquatic ecosystems. <laughs> Um, we have introduced some restrictions over the last uh, couple of years in some of the mountain national parks, which I'll chat about on the next slide. And then we are looking at in compliance. And so um, are people complying with our restrictions and um, we're, we're um, getting some extra help from our warden service to go out and, and um, spread that message. So here are the restrictions um, that are in place. Basically, we have these restrictions um, called restricted activity orders. If you've recreated in the park, you may have come across this in the last couple of years. You, uh, the use of motorized, non-motorized, or quad, any aquatic recreational gear is restricted in Yoho, Kootenai, Banff, and Waterton to the holders of a valid aquatic invasive species prevention permit. There are three different types of permits available. And depending on what park you are in and what type of watercraft or gear you have is gonna determine what type of permit you need. But if you're going to any of these parks, um, you're going to have to get the AIS prevention permit um, to, to get into any water body that you're, you're wanting to recreate in. Um, this is with the exception of Waterton Lakes National Parks. Um, motorized watercraft in Waterton Lakes National Park since 2017 has required a 90 day quarantine for all motorized watercraft. So if this feels a little bit confusing, um, there isn't at this time consistency across what you need. The only thing that's consistent right now is you do need that aquatic invasive species prevention permit. And again, depending on what park you're in, um, that's either an inspection permit. So going through an inspection station similar to what you've seen in the province over the last decade, 
self-certification permit um, and a seasonal permit. So as I said, this might be feel a little bit confusing, um, just knowing that that permit is, is necessary. Um, we do have really good infographics on our websites um, at the visitor information centers and um, as handouts available. If you, are, if you do have um, plans to recreate in the Mount National Parks, you can take a look at these and it can really um, show you what do I have? What kind of permit do I need? Where do I get my permit? So again, um, just to reiterate, depending on the park that you're coming into, um, it's gonna depend what kind of permit uh, you're going to get, but our self-certification permits are in these little boxes. You'll see them at pretty much every water body that you go to right now in the parks. You can get them also at visitor information centers. They're available online to print off. Um, you can get them at campgrounds. And our inspection permits, um, this is mandatory uh, in Waterton Lakes National Park right now if you have non-motorized watercraft. Um, and it's voluntary at the time at this time in uh, in Banff and Yoho and Kootenai. But basically you will come through with our inspection permit and get a staff member to look at your watercraft and um, sort of make sure that it is clean, drain and dry and they'll give you a permit. And then we have the seasonal permit option. So Waterton Lakes National Park right now is the only park offering a seasonal permit. Essentially, you can go and do an hour long course with their staff um, and then you can do a little quiz and um, you get a permit that allows you to use your watercraft in the park for the whole season um, as you're committing to um, complying with those clean, drain and dry uh, requirements. So this is what they look like. Um, so if you go up to one of those little boxes on the side of Bull Lake, for example, you can pull out one of these. Um, the top part is the self-certification uh, permit that you'd have to have on you. And the bottom part is just a little bit of information that we'd like to collect um, to sort of track the progress of the project. So I just wanted to share a little bit of data um, that we've collected over the last two years. As I mentioned, this started, um, we, we got funding for this uh, in 2021. So um, it's a pretty new program, but it is interesting to see the first little bits of data that's coming out of this. We're like, we wanna look at the risk. So what is the risk of you know, the majority of the watercraft that are coming into, into um, the mountain parks that are non-motorized? Um, what is the risk? So we're looking at the location of last use as one criteria. We're categorizing high risk as those coming um, from a location with known uh, zebra quagga mussels. In Banff and Lake Louise, Yoho and Kootenai, uh, we actually had about a third of folks that were coming in um, from, uh, had last used their watercraft in an area with a zebra and quagga mussel. So we know we have that movement of folks um, coming from those areas into the park. The next thing we look at for risk is how many people that come through our inspection uh, stations fail. So failure means there's mud, dirt, animal or plant material, or the dry time requirements are not met. It doesn't mean you're not going to be able to come and, and use your watercraft. It just means um, that somebody's going to wash your boat for you or wash your, your gear for you. Um, interestingly, um, in Banff and Yoho and Kootenai, we had about half of folks that were coming into those inspection stations with some sort of uh, mud or dirt on their watercraft. And, and this is based on not, this is just the non-motorized watercraft data. So we do think that there is some sort of gap in, in people getting the message that they need to have clean gear when they're coming into the parks. And then the last thing we look at is compliance. So based on some estimates on surveys and counts on water bodies on busy days, um, we were able to estimate the percent of people that enter a water body without getting an AIS permit. And across the board, it hovers between 40 and 50%. So again, we know that we do have some work to do on, on getting the message out and getting compliance up um, and getting people just to really take ownership of, of the mountain national parks and clean and drain and dry their gear to prevent that spread of aquatic invasive species. So just to summarize, um, AIS are bad <laughs> for the ecological integrity of the mountain parks, for our native fish species, and where we sit right at the top of all the headwaters is really um, an important piece. Um, recreational equipment and gear can spread AIS. We want to prevent it, so um, we want you to clean your stuff. Prove to us that you can clean your stuff by getting an AIS prevention permit, and if your stuff's dirty, we're going to clean it for you, so don't be shy. Come on down to the inspection stations. Thank you to everyone who, who's doing this already and share it with all your friends. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. That's, that was a great summary and kind of shocking how um, 
how many people are not getting them or are showing up from risk areas as well, which obviously increases the risk. So there's definitely some questions for the later portion. And I want to uh, now bring up Angela 10 with Trout Unlimited Canada um, to bring up her presentation. So, so thank you again, uh, Megan. Angela is a lover of both fish and the outdoors. Um, so it was inevitable that she would fall into the world of fisheries work. Her studies at the U of A have led her to cultivate a strong background in conservation biology, while her work in the field gave her a lot of valuable experience and perspective from uh, those who've lived and worked on the land. Angela currently lives and works in Calgary as a biologist with Trout Unlimited Canada. So welcome, Angela. My name is Angela Ten and I'm a biologist with Trail Limited Canada and today I'll talk a little bit about um, the rough and loose technique that is used a lot for trail closures. So quickly, Trail Limited Canada is an environmental NGO um, with volunteer-based chapters all across Canada and professional staff in Calgary and Guelph, Ontario. We're focused on conserving and protecting Canada's freshwater ecosystem and resources. But back to the issue at hand. Uh, trails and rough and loose. So the problem, the problem underlying all of this is that there are thousands of kilometers of linear disturbance features that deliver sediment laden water to streams. For example, this is a road in the White Brush Creek watershed and you can see the amount of sediment that is just dumping off of this road and into the stream, which is on the right hand side of the image. Why is this a problem? Well, our native salmonids, our native trout, they didn't evolve to tolerate this amount of sediment delivery all throughout the year. This here is a little West Slope cutthroat trout egg, and these incubating eggs need open spaces in between gravels in order to remain oxygenated and to survive. Um, when there's a lot of sediment coming down from linear disturbances, in this case, it was an undesignated OHV trail, these spawning gravels can get filled in with the sediment. And any eggs that are here will be smothered and will eventually perish. So is sediment and water a bad thing everywhere? No, some fish really like turbid environments with little visibility, just like in prairie streams and stuff. Um, for example, the stone cat has a lot of features that help uh, them adapt to turbid environments, like these sensory barbels that let them feel their way around, and small eyes, since visibility isn't as important in an environment where you can't see anything. But if you take a look at our native trout, char, and whitefish, these guys are visual predators, and they really need to see their food. You can see that they, compared to the stonefish I showed, the stone cat I showed before, these guys have really big, beautiful eyes. And it's pretty hard to see when your environment looks like this. So how can we address this? Well, one solution is your traditional erosion and sediment control devices. These conventional approaches to erosion and sediment control typically fail. This here is uh, Trout Creek and the black things uh, that are lining like the creek, that those are uh, straw waddles. They're a very common conventional erosion and sediment control measure. Um, the cause of damage here was, uh, like the cause of sedimentation here was the compacted soils and continued access by cattle, vehicles, all that kind of stuff. But the waddles don't treat any of that. They just treat the symptom, which is sediment. It's a band-aid approach that treats the symptom and not the cause, which is why it's a problem. However, you can tick off your little due diligence box to say that you did something about the sediment. Here's another trail feature on Trail Creek. There was a bridge on the left or on the right hand side of the screen that was installed and some erosion sediment control devices. So these straw waddles that the arrows are pointing to, uh, they were placed on the trail to deal with the sediment. People are using the bridge, uh, which is great, but the compacted soils on, and the slope of the trail are the problem. That's what's contributing all the sediment into this watershed. And this is not being addressed with the due diligence uh, straw waddles that have been placed and have been kicked out of the way and washed out. In this image, there's more straw waddles, compacted soils here. They don't permit any infiltration of water. The water can't soak into the ground at all. And instead, the, because it accelerates uh, the flow of water and increases the erosive power of the wa uh, water. Waddles, the straw waddles don't address this and instead the water carved out a channel underneath and went underneath um, the uh, waddle and sediment issues persist and all the sediment instead drained right into the creek. This is a pretty predictable result when you have that kind of uh, measure. This used to be habitat for West Slope cutthroat trout and now it's basically one big mud hole. Here's another example. This is Four Mile Creek in the Wipers Creek watershed. Um, upslope here is like the forestry trunk road 
And there's a direct connection for water to flow off the trunk road down this trail and into Four Mile Creek down below. There was cross drains installed, but the cross drains don't address the root cause of, of uh, sedimentation, which is uh, soil compaction and continued access from livestock and vehicles. So this here is the intended flow path. When the cross train was installed, that's what was supposed to happen. And that's what did happen for a time. But once the cross train got full of sediment, um, sediment could resume, sediment and the water could resume flowing past the cross train and down into the creek, which is what it's current, it was doing at the time. It only addresses one issue, sediment transport, and doesn't address all of the issues such as compaction and unauthorized access. So here's a different solution. A different solution is uh, rough and loose. This does address root causes and it expedites natural recovery of sites. So in this example here, it is um, sediment is being delivered down the trail system here. It's an unauthorized motorized trail and um, it's causing a lot of dirt to run off the trail surface, which is eventually connected to a stream. And in order to fix that, we made it rough and loose. So rough and loose is a restoration technique that was created by Dave Polster. It's basically creating a checkerboard pattern of pits and piles. So you dig a big hole and all of the material that you excavated from the hole gets put right next to it in a pile. So the pattern is pit, pile, pit, pile, and then you kind of like alternate the pattern in the next row following. Uh, this uh, does a lot of things. It like, um, it breaks up the flow of water and it decompacts the soil, makes it nice and fluffy so that water can sink into it. It usually is, it's best when it's paired with distribution of large woody debris. So that's things like big trees, um, root wads, all that kind of clutter. It's really important to kickstart natural revegetation as this, would, with this debris creates perching spots for birds to deposit seeds. And it also creates visual and physical clutter to deter continued access. With a trail feature removed, vehicle use was discontinued and there's nowhere for water to go but into the ground now. It can't travel, like if you think about water flowing down a slope, it's not gonna go up and down and up and down. And this is what the rough and loose accomplishes. It, water just doesn't move that way. So instead it just soaks straight into the ground. Essentially by doing rough and loose, you're breaking up the watershed of a drainage network into much smaller micro watersheds. So here, for example, is a pre-rehabilitation -re drainage area. It's basically one big watershed where water flows in one direction. It can't soak into the soil because they're all compacted. So instead it runs off the surface, gaining speed and increasing the erosive power. When you do rough and loose, this by the way is the exact same trail uh, after rehabilitation that I showed in the last slide. Um, it's all, uh, the watershed is kind of broken up into these little micro watersheds and water can be collected in each pit where it can slowly soak into the loose soils and recharge the groundwater. And most importantly, not deliver sediment into the watershed. So let's explore a couple other examples of rough and loose. This here is um, a trail in the Wipers Creek watershed. Uh, approximately 150 meters of trail was delivering sediment directly into the stream and the stream channel was completely choked with sediment. So we used rough and loose on the trail and as well as some bioengineering techniques closer to the stream. Vehicle use is now virtually impossible and there's nowhere for the water to go but uh, into the soils. We excavated all of the previously dependent deposited sediment out of the stream channel and now it can re-naturalize during channel forming flows. But what happens when it rains? Well, let's compare and contrast. So this is a road in the Wipers Creek watershed. And uh, you can see that during a rainfall event in June, it is just dumping sediment into the creek. The surface runoff is very, very high and it's connected into streams. And that's what it looks like uh, where it eventually hits the stream. There's large volumes of fine sediment being delivered and the water looks pretty mucky. This was the rehabilitation area. It's the same valley at the same time with the same amount of precipitation and actually a steeper slope than that road was. But there's no surface runoff, no erosion, and no sediment being delivered to the streams. So if you take a look here, you can kind of see the stream flowing through the middle of the image. Look how clear it is compared to the muddy stream from before. Looks fishy to me. Here's another example. This is just another small slope that was all compacted and needed some rehab because it was draining sediment into the stream. 
And this was rough and loose done by hand with pickaxes and shovels. You can see that again, the soil is nice and fluffy and if it were to rain or water was to fall on this, um, it would soak into the ground instead of running right off. And just to further drive the point home, here's another before, this is in Mackenzie Creek. And here it is after. The, there was a lot of woody debris and vegetation incorporated into the rough and loose here. And since there's no sight lines, you can barely even tell that this used to be a trail, there's no access anymore, which is great. One of the common criticisms we get about rough and loose is that it's just so messy. But there's a lot of problems with keeping rehabilitation sites neat. So this is a previous rehabilitation area in the Beaver Creek watershed. Uh, you can see some traditional erosion sediment control measures that are failing. Uh, all in all, it was very easy to travel and drainage pathways have begun reestablishing here. Um, the rehabilitation that was done here tried to treat the problem of sediment, but it didn't address any root causes like the steep slope or uh, compacted soils or the continued access by cattle and uh, motorized vehicles. You can see in the kind of right hand side of the image, they put up some hitching posts to keep you out. And you can see that that was very easy to ignore. So the drainage pathways are all reestablishing and uh, the work here needs to get maintained or repeated. Here's a site in Mackenzie Creek where we did do rough and loose, but it was again, too neat. The rough and loose was really small. We didn't throw woody debris everywhere. And um, this trail is a uh, undesignated trail, which was reclaimed to protect the restoration site that we had uh, down the trail. So we wanted to keep access out so that all the work that we did could stay protected and continue and grow basically. But because the rough and loose was too neat, the sight lines along this trail were all still clear. The trail and the destination are all still visible. So this work was done in 2019. And here's what it looked like in 2022 when we checked up on it. Because everything, the rehabilitation site was kept too clean, vehicles didn't see this as a barrier. It didn't register that this was uh, a, re a rehabilitation area and use continued to happen on the trail. It, all in all, the root cause wasn't addressed. And again, problem persists. Um, this is back to being a compacted trail that will deposit soils into the watershed. And another important thing to mention about rough and loose is that like it looks really messy, but you have to remember that recovery takes time. Rough and loose expedites natural recovery and lets nature do the bulk of the work, but nature needs time to do work. Um, this, so generally recovery looks worse before it looks better and that's okay. This is a, a site near Foster Creek in BC. It's a picture taken by Dave Polster. They did a whole bunch of rough and loose on the hill slope here um, to, try to, uh, to try to speed up the natural recovery. And they planted a couple of pi uh, pi pioneering plants in the area, like some willows and a couple of alder, I think maybe were planted here at the same time. This was in April, 2010. And the red arrow is just pointing to like a reference area because this is the after in 2013. Um, you can see that it's the exact same area. There's that weird structure uh, up, up, up top. And like, look how much better it looks. It looked pretty bad before, but once you gave it some time to recover, gave it time for the plants to grow, it looks much, much better. In places with less topsoil, more mineral soil, less light, that kind of stuff, recovery can take longer. This was three years, but in places, uh, but some places it could take five, 10 years before you see any progress, before it starts to look better. And that's just kind of what it is because we're trying to let nature do the work. And so we're more hands off here. There was no maintenance on this site after the initial planting. So most of the revegetation you see here is actually completely natural recruitment and growth. So next time you see rough and loose and it looks pretty bad, maybe just take a second and be like, how might this look in five years? Hopefully better, maybe 10 years, it'll look even better. And yeah. Rough and loose is a really great tool to address soil compaction and sedimentation, but just like any tool, there's a time and a place. For example, you wouldn't use this on an active designated trail. This is generally used uh, on decommissioned and undesignated trails, so places where you wouldn't be. When it's utilized properly, it can have really, really great results. And it's much cheaper than buying and transporting big boulders, cement blocks, or other erosion sediment devices, uh, especially into remote areas. All it takes is a machine and some time, and um, you get some pretty great results. If you have any other questions about Rough and Loose, you can email me here at uh, my email or uh, give me a call. 
uh, which is also listed on the slide. So yeah, that's it for me. Great, that was that was excellent, Angela. Um, amazing to see the before and the after comparisons um, and what that these can do. I, there's already lots of questions popping in related to this in the Q&A and the chat. So um, again, a reminder, put your questions in the Q&A if you can, please. Um, so we're going to uh, move on to, uh, I'll ask Daryl and Jerry to, to turn on their, their cameras and their mics while Logan loads our next video. So this is a, a launch of a first time it's being seen in public, um, a video that was done um, primarily with uh, Jerry and Daryl's colleagues, uh, Gary with the quad squad, so the crow's nest past quad squad. So Jerry Seabock and Daryl Ferguson are joining us to answer questions today in the Q&A session. And I just want to get them to say hello and they will um, we'll play the video in a second. Hi, Jerry. And and Daryl, are hello. you? Hello. Is your sound working? How are you doing? <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. Thank you guys for being here today. Um, Logan's going to pull up the video, um, which features um, Jerry and Daryl's colleague, uh, Gary, um, from some of the work they've been doing in the Crow's Nest Pass to manage off highway vehicles and, and be steward, a stewardship group in that area. So take it away, Logan. To promote safe riding be our main goal and to promote awareness on environmental damage that OHVs can cause. Also to learn uh, a love of the forestry, a love of the land and, and an appreciation of, of all that we have out in this uh, great area that we, that we live in and, and are fortunate enough to, to recreate in. Gary Clark, I'm the president of the Coast Nest Pass Quads Fund. Uh, the types of conservation work that we've done in, in the past, of course, bridges is, is our main focus. Uh, we've also done repairing work on, along the riverbanks, again, uh, with cows and fish and, and also WC as well. The number one reason that, that we do the bridges over the, over the waterways is to protect the fish habitat. Uh, to, uh, when OHVs cross waterways, for example, they tend to put silt into the stream and the silt goes down and will fill in the, uh, the pools where the, where the fish are. It, it covers up the, the plants that the fish eat and, and food that the fish eat. The work that we do, we feel, is extremely important. Uh, not only to teach uh, other people how to ride sensibly uh, and follow examples of Quad Squad members, to stay on the designated trails, not to go off the trails, not to play in the water, definitely, and not to cross water if there's a bridge available. The difference that we've noticed when we've, we've put in a bridge uh, or a new trail, for example, this trail here, the, no one has been down it yet. We don't have the signs up. It'll be hopefully completed today and we'll eliminate the, the creek crossing. And it's just amazing when we come back and we notice that there has nobody has gone down the old bridge or the old trails and uh, there's well, the trails are well used and, and packed down. We have assessed some trails in a provincial park and there's one trail in particular that has the, the stream has taken down the course of the trail. And again, we're out with the government officials and asked if there was any uh, type of fish in this in this stream and he said oh yeah he said there's west slope cutthroat trout and uh, we went upstream maybe 15 feet and we could see the trout in the stream and I, I couldn't believe it because to me it looked like there's about three inches of water there but uh, and I think that's a lot of uh, what the OHV industry thinks they, they think maybe oh it's just a little stream there can't be fish in here but you'd be amazed where the fish actually go so that's why we like to treat every stream as if there is fish in it uh, again this this stream that we're crossing now does not have fish in it but it does go into a fish bearing stream and that'll keep the silt out of that stream as well when we're out on the trails Sometimes we see people that are abusing the trails, they're going through water. Uh, we'll, we'll stop them and, and tell them, hey, look what you're doing is it, not right. Like, again, enforcement is key. There, there's an awful lot of people that just hop on a ATV and go out for a ride and, and have absolutely zero training on, on how to ride or, or what, to, what to do on the trails. That's why 
Uh, anybody that's a new rider should join a, a club like the Quad Squad or, or the various clubs that are throughout the province, with, uh, whichever area you live in, and uh, go out and, and learn how to ride properly and responsibly. And, and again, let's keep our trails open and, and let's do it in a responsible, reasonable manner. The long and short of it is if we keep playing in the waters and, and washing our machines in the creeks and, and doing all kinds of things we're not supposed to be doing, the biggest impact is on the fish and there's a possibility some of those fish are going to disappear from that those particular areas. So that's what we're trying to do, not only by building the bridges and getting wheels out of water, but also by educating people as to the effects of going into the water and stuff. The uh, bridges that we put in, we're extremely proud of. The trail work that we do is that we're extremely proud of. And not only because we put them in, it's not bragging rights, but it's because we feel good because we're able to do something uh, positive towards the environment and to help protect the, the fish habitat, uh, particularly the trout in, in this area. So uh, basically, uh, OHV riding is, uh, is a lot of fun. We all enjoy it and we also enjoy working on the land uh, such as we're doing today. Laud and applaud all the other stewards of the land. We're not the only ones. There's thousands that do similar work to what we do all across the province and all across the country. So uh, kudos to everybody that, that works well uh, with the land and, and let's continue to protect the environment and let's continue to enjoy the trails. And if we can do that responsibly and safely, then maybe we can have a shot at, at keeping these trails. And uh, we don't need a bunch more new trails. We just need to maintain and, and enforce the trails that we have. So as I mentioned, that was the launch of the Native Trout Collaborative Communications team um, off highway vehicle related video. And, and you saw how the relationship to that make, make sense to the work that Angela talked about in rough and loosing trails that are now closed that, that aren't part of these systems that, are, that are, have um, the approved trails. So we're going to launch a poll and we'd like to um, get you to provide us um, with your thoughts. What, how did how did this key, the, the info in here make you feel and what key messages um, you know, can you take from this? So, um, yeah, so please fill in the poll. And, um, and just to get a sense, we, we want to get a bit of feedback because it's brand new. And, um, and there's always so much you could put in a video, but can't fit everything in a few minute video. So we'd love to just get a sense of how it made you feel. And if you could, once you fill that in, in the chat function, please enter one key message that you took or you got from that video. So yeah, please use the chat function and tell us what was one key message um, that, that sticks with you that came out from you. So um, if, for those of you that haven't, if you could just finish filling in the poll, we'll leave it up for a few more seconds and then um, we'll share the results. So it looks like a lot of people come away from watching that video with um, optimism um, and quite a few with a, ha a happy sense, but also a, an assortment of other other sentiments. So thank you for that feedback. Please do put the key messages you took from that in the chat. So that gives us a bit more feedback for future videos as well. So thank you very much. So next I want to welcome um, our, our next speaker and he, a little bit of switching gears from recreation and trail closures and uh, bridges, a little bit different. So we're changing focus a little bit. The next um, presentation is from Brian, Brian Joubert. He's going to tell us, can cell phones kill trout? So um, Brian is a policy analyst and um, is with Fish and Wildlife Division based in Edmonton. He is interested in cross-disciplinary approaches to conservation, better understanding uh, fish and wildlife uh, as part of a cross-disciplinary and complex social ecological systems. His research uh, is about looking at interests between human relationships with wildlife and how sustainable use and wildlife harvest can contribute to a contemporary society. So take it away, um, you just need to go full screen and you'll be ready to go. I'm not quite hearing All your right. sound yet. Thanks. Thanks everybody. I was trying to put on my camera. Oh, there we go. My camera was disabled. There's my Yes, it's my on mug. now. Great. There's my mug for you all to see. So good evening, everybody. Thank you. 
And, Can you uh, just uh, go to full screen, yeah. Brian? We're still just yeah. seeing partial. Thank you. It was just a little bit delayed. So yeah, I just want to talk a little bit about some research we did a few years ago. Um, somewhat of a maybe tongue-in-cheek title called Can Smartphones Kill Trout? The Mortality of Memorable Sized or Large Bull Trout After Photo Releases. And um, really the question was, can prolonged handling associated with photo releases, i.e. catch and release of a fish and bull trout in this case, with a photograph, so the added air exposure and the prolonged time, meaningfully elevate mortality? And so we asked this question for a number of reasons. Um, one, obviously, being the prevalence of, of mobile devices, right? We all have a phone, similar devices, even those of us still using digital cameras, we have a means to take really quick photos out in the field. Um, there's an incentive for sharing within the angling community. So many of our devices, we can take the photo and share it instantly or shortly thereafter getting out of the field. And there's something, I mean, I've, I'm, a, I'm a lifelong angler and hunter, and there's definitely something you know, psychological in our past about the status of sharing our photos of the pursuit you know we probably don't articulate it like that anymore in 2023 but there's probably something a little bit baked into our evolution there and of course there's no shortage of it right i mean many of us who fish you i mean if you're on social media you're just seeing fish photos all the time there's the rarity of larger bull trout and i'm going to speak to that a little bit uh, in the forthcoming slides and then of course the species status so you know our provincial fish, it's been catch and release since uh, 94. It's, uh, it's listed provincially um, as threatened, and uh, it's also listed federally. The Saskatchewan Nelson River system bull trout are also federally listed as threatened as well. So huge declines, much like West Slope cutthroat trout, just it's a species that has had its range contract significantly from its historic range um, and just not as common anymore. I also want to point out as an important kind of foundation to this work around big trout, big bull trout, um, and how they make us feel, or you know, our incentive to share these photos. Those three guys on the screen there have handled tens of thousands of fish in their careers. They know uh, they're no strangers to handling trout, and uh, they're all beaming from catching large bull trout. We get excited when we see these things. We get happy when we see them. And so our premise here was we wanted to simulate an average angler, not an avid angler, not an elite angler, a kind of somebody who's camping with their family on a weekend and hooks into a large bull trout and goes, holy cow, that's the biggest trout I've ever seen. I want to take a couple photos, measure the fish to see how big it is, let my buddy take a couple photos and we'll let it go. It's catch and release, no problem. We'll let it swim. It's not malicious or nefarious. People are just excited to catch these fish. So we'll talk briefly about this notion of, of memorable size or big. And I think a lot of the time as anglers, our angler brain, when we think of bull trout, we think of that kind of brute on the right there. Right? We're like, oh yeah, bull trout, they're these gigantic 80, 90 centimeter trout that live in these mountain creeks and it's pretty cool. But those fish are pretty rare. In fact, they're incredibly rare. If you look at, if you look at this distribution, so that's the number of bull trout uh, on the y-axis and the, the, the fork length, the length of the fish on the x-axis. These light bars was, were from uh, electrofishing monitoring uh, in the Old Man River. And so these are bull trout. And you can see most of the bull trout that were being caught are in this you know, 10 centimeter to high 20s. They're the size of a pretty typical cutthroat trout. They're not these gigantic bull trout that we think of. The gigantic bull trout are over here. Very, very, very few and far between. And so the fish that we studied for this research, we called them large because that's the dark bars over here. Um, they were average fork length was, was uh, 60 centimeters. So large by just about any standard. And if we look at, monitoring results from unexploded populations, for example, in Jacques Lake and Jasper, you see the same thing. Most of the bull trout are actually quite small, 20 to 30 centimeters. Pinto Lake, same thing. So a large bull trout is, is, is not as common sometimes as we think they are. We just see the pictures of the big ones. So we think that sort of every deep pool in the river has one of these big massive bull trout, but it's not necessarily the case. 
So, spoiler, I'll get to the meaty bit right off the bat without, you know, the, <laughs> the more boring methodology, but I'll get into that in a bit. We did, we, we certainly killed more fish than we thought. So we gave them this photo release treatment and then we released them into a, a pen back into the lake. And uh, the fish that we subjected to the photo release, we killed uh, uh, 30 percent, 33 percent of them. We killed a third of the fish, which is a lot higher than I think a lot of us expected. In fact, even the ones that we gave the instant release, caught them, released them, we still killed three out of 20. So we had a sample size of 50 fish in total, 50 large fish, which is still, you know, that's a 15 percent mortality rate. And water temperatures were well within range of um, of uh, optimum for bull trout. So averaged around 13 degrees for the three days that we did this. So we observed the fish for 24 hours in the pen and then we released them and then did a second a second uh, um, uh, control. So we were there for a few days. So you know, water temperature averaged around 13 degrees, which is not cold for a bull trout, but it's well within range of, of what optimum bull trout habitat would have. So not unusually warm. And air temperatures for July, we did it in July to replicate summer, although this lake was quite high altitude, 1800 meters. Um, and it, it varied from freezing to about 25 centigrade. So pretty, pretty typical air temperatures for, for summer. So, you know, for a lot of science, a sample size of 50 fish is not huge, um, but for large bull trout, it's massive. It's a gargantuan sample. And the lake where we did this was a lake that was naturally fishless. And then these bull trout were introduced in the 80s when there was a drought and there was a sort of cut off oxbow on the wild hay. And there was fisheries biologists found all these bull trout and said, hey, we should rescue them. Let's heli lift them, put them in this fishless lake uh, just north of the Jasper border. So it's a very remote lake. People went back 10 years and found, wow, there's a single fish system with all these huge bull trout. So it's a great laboratory to study this kind of thing. And there's almost nowhere I can think of that in three days, you're gonna angle 50 bull trout with an average fork length of 60 centimeters. You're just not gonna find it. So from a field logistics point of view, it's extremely rare to undertake research in the field like this with 50 adult bull trout. Nonetheless, not a huge sample. So we ran a thing called the binomial distribution where we just looked at the probability of coming up with the same results that we saw, this 30% or 33% mortality of the photo release trout. And we said, if we did this 10,000 times, what would happen? Pretty much the same thing with a little bit of overlap. So again, our mortality, the dark bars, probably an average right in the kind of low 30% and the regular release right around 15%. So again, just to sort of numerically validate what we saw. And it's important sometimes, you know, as, as, as scientists, we sort of chase this numerical validity and the significance, but sometimes we also need to stop and ask ourselves if, if something isn't statistically significant, could it still be biologically significant? That's an important question for us to ask. And so how long did it take us to release these fish? Two photos, measurement, two photos. The average was 112 seconds. And so a lot of anglers go, holy cow, you guys, were you eating a sandwich while you were releasing these things? Why did it take so long? And that was with, again, people with a lot of experience handling fish. Um, and that's just how long it took, you know, and, and that's surprising. We have some other discrete observation data of non-trout angling. So mostly a cool water species, walleye, um, and then, you know, suckers, gold eye and stuff in rivers. And a, a lot of people take more than a minute to release fish. And often, you know, if people are avid anglers or we call them elite anglers and they, they just, you know, eat, sleep and breathe fishing and they think about fishing, they're good at releasing fish. It's what they do. So it seems implausible to them. But a lot of people, they're not being malicious. They just, they're just not in that mindset or thinking about how to release fish really quickly, having the tools there, having the, the equipment available to release a fish quickly. So you can see how our range there took between 75 to 162 on the long end. Um, and if we dropped a fish, like you see on the right here, we would pick it up and take the photos again, just like someone who's maybe not an avid angler thinking about quick release would do. And so even guys that have handled tens of thousands of fish still occasionally drop fish, it does happen. There was no relationship between the size of the fish and the time to release. In the case of these big fish, there was no, I couldn't say that the slightly bigger ones took slightly longer. That wasn't the case. So other research in the Northwestern US, in Idaho, for example, um, discreetly observing anglers. So 
you know, having staffs and watch people fishing with spotting scopes. They found that a large trout, which they called 30 plus centimeters, would take um, on average, you know, into the into the 20 seconds, high 20s, low 30s without a photo. Then when they added a photo, they typically added another 18 to 20 seconds. So there we're already for a regular size rainbow or cutthroat plus a photo, we're already starting to get into the 50 plus second range for a lot of releases to occur. Again, longer than I think we intuitively think it takes to release fish. So the potential impact here, oh, and I, sh I should also mention those fish that we observed in the pen, there was some that we released that even after we took them out of the pen, after the observation, two in particular, we released them and they just swam to the bottom of the lake and they just sat there moribund. They were maintaining equilibrium so they could keep themselves upright, but they just sat finning for a few hours on the bottom. And so they could have been very vulnerable to mechanical injury if we put them in a, a river or to predation if they were smaller. They could have been predated upon by other larger bull trout, uh, bald eagles, etc. if they could reach them. So that could have been another two mortality potential mortalities. We just couldn't call them mortalities because they didn't die in the observation period. So if we did a, a quick thought exercise and we said, okay, let's say that 80% of anglers do what we think of as an ideal release, short release, sub 30 seconds, handle the fish well, keep them wet, and they kill 2% of the fish. People often argue, you know, what would a typical release or a typical mortality rate be? 2%, 3%, 3.5%. It, 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 there's a lot of variables, which I will get into. Um, so let's say they kill 2% of the fish and we have 19% of people doing photo releases or similar, maybe not so great releases and they kill 30%, which is about what we found. And then there's 1% of people that kill everything. And they either kill it because they're just really poor at fish handling. They don't know the regulations, which happens. And they go, oh, that's a nice trout. I think I'll take that back to the campsite and fry it. Or maybe they're just maliciously keeping fish. But one, that's not a lot of people. So they've killed 100%. We end up with a mortality rate of 8.3%. So that's only 8.3% of angled fish. Not all the fish, just the fish that have been caught. However, on a lot of Alberta's rivers and streams, we have measured based on uh, uh, population sampling and then creel surveys with anglers that the recycle rate we're catching as many or more fish than we estimate are in the rivers. So we're catching fish hypothetically more than once in a season. So the recycle rate is 100 plus percent. So 8.3 percent of angled fish turns into 8.3 percent of the population of mature fish. And so research has shown that with bull trout, when you get to 7 to 10 percent of that of that population dying, you can start having population level effects. So it becomes a serious conservation risk. So this is something very important for us to think about with a species at risk and a provincial fish. Partly because bull trout are pretty vulnerable to catch. Those anglers would know that, you know, a lot of the times if you if you show a bull trout a nice white streamer, it's going to pounce on it, right? They They live in low productivity systems, they eat, they want to eat. Uh, large specimens have higher spawning probability. So a bull trout of about 50 centimeters has about a 40% chance of spawning or probability of spawning. When that fish gets to 80 centimeters, which is a giant, the probability goes up well into the 90s. So these big fish are really important for reproduction and spawning. And then there's what we call a depensatory effect, which is like a positive feedback loop. The rarer bigger fish get, the more unlikely we are to catch them. When we catch them, the more likely we are to be like, whoa, I got one of these things. I've been trying to get a big one for years. Let's take a photograph of it. Again, we're not being malicious. We're just kind of excited that we call one of these big fish. So context is also important. So, you know, some anglers might see this and be like, oh, I don't think it's that bad. I think you guys are over-exaggerating it. But context is critical in this situation, right? And a lot of the times we don't know, right? We release fish that are healthy, but we don't know what happens to them within seconds of them swimming away. So we used a particular response, four photos and a measurement. We know a lot of anglers only take one photo, which cuts that exposure time down a lot. And uh, mortality in some species is not as high, they're not as, 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 as vulnerable. Uh, system productivity matters. So the further south you go, lower altitudes, sufficient geology, some rivers are just way more productive, have a much higher density of fish and can sustain higher mortality. 
bull trout are slow growing. The fish we caught there averaged 13 years and they were actually quite fast growing compared to other fish. Um, uh, bull trout, so we aged them from the otoliths. And Alberta is a cold place with mostly unproductive streams on the east slopes, right? We're not like southern Idaho or southern Montana, uh, where the sufficient geology and the growing degree days make a big difference. Solutions, we can regulate catch and release like Washington has done. And uh, I think that's two course. Washington, if, the, if, a, if a salmonid is on catch and release, you're not even allowed to take it out of the water. I mean, it's probably too coarse for a regulation to do that. We could have closures and sanctuaries for areas where we know these genetically pure fish or reds, et cetera, but are they large enough for species like bull trout that migrate and move a lot? Also, we lose angling opportunity, which is unpopular. And you know, we wanna make sure people have opportunities to fish. We also have now started thinking about this cryptic mortality or unknown mortality in other species. And so anglers hold this important key in terms of angler behavior. And generally it's really good, right? We've seen all the keep them wet and we've seen on various internet forums and social media, people encouraging each other to keep fish wet, minimize air exposure. So anglers can do important work. They can reduce fight time and exposure, um, minimize air exposure, 15 to 20 seconds is often a strong recommendation. It's quite quick. Sub 30 is, 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 is pretty easy to, to do. 15 to 20 is probably achievable. Um, things like nets and barbless hooks. Barbless hooks reduce handling time sometimes because it's easier to unhook. They don't, sometimes the, the, the research difference in their kind of hooking mortality is, it's not all that different, but they are a useful tool to use because it's so much quicker to unhook the fish and you minimize exposure time. And avoid extremes, right? We've seen time of day closures in Alberta uh, recently. And so, you know, it, it's less advisable to catch native trout on blistering hot days, low stream flows. Um, it's, it's, they, they're just not as resilient in those extreme environmental conditions, especially warmth. And that's that. I wasn't sure if I was running out of time there. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, wow, the the comments, of course, about those huge fish like you saw and the mortality rates are, are quite are quite shocking. So uh, thank you for that great information and, and some solutions that like to help us address that. We are going to move um, into our uh, Q&A session. So I will ask um, all of our panelists to uh, turn on their videos and uh, get ready to unmute themselves as I ask, begin to ask questions. And, and Brian, if you wouldn't mind just unsharing your screen, that would be great. Um, and all of uh, our panelists can rejoin us. And we have a lot of questions. So as I mentioned, um, we encourage you to upvote the questions that you are most interested in. So I am going to start kind of at the top of that list, which has um, questions with, with the most um, thumbs up, basically, to encourage um, us to get through as many as we can. And so our first question is actually going to be for the Quad Squad folks. So um, for Daryl and um, Jerry. Um, has there been any conversation about licensing for backcountry off-highway vehicle users, um, something like a short course or a disclaimer on a license application to reduce impacts? Um, as, as mentioned, a, a lot of people just don't, they don't know, aren't aware of things. So can you guys comment on your thoughts on that and both on the policy, but also kind of your perspective? Yeah, I, I would like to see um... some sort of licensing or at least a, uh, a course that would uh, educate people, but Yeah, but it's hard to know the solution, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. Um... I guess I'll encourage those in the chat to say, what do you think? If, if you are an off-highway vehicle user of any kind or, or other, like, you know, it's one thing to say somebody else should, but, but would you be willing if you're, if you're in that boat? Um, what's, what's a good fit? So th thanks, Jerry. I, I think this is something our politicians and our, as well as our users and our managers at, on the provincial and federal level need to hear feedback on. So we're going to um, move to another question, which is, um, I think maybe I will ask, um, uh, I'll ask 
I'm not sure if I should ask this to you. I'll ask Angela to respond and perhaps um, Megan as well. With regarding species hybridization, what's being done to reduce the impact of hybrids on native trout? Um, I know Angela, that's not exactly what you're talking about, but it, do you feel comfortable um, providing some feedback so people, because we didn't talk about that today. Uh, I think we'll let Megan respond first and I'll just add more because I feel sure. like she is much better educated on this topic than me. <laughs> Go ahead, Megan. Um, yeah, no problem. So, yes, um, in the Mountain National Parks, I can speak to what's happening in Banff National Park. Um, so we have been uh, for the last few years, maybe I want to say 10, <laughs> but hasn't been that long, um, have been uh, doing some restoration uh, for native trout, um, specifically West Slope Cutthroat Trout in uh, the Bow River area. Um, this includes Hidden Lake, uh, Catherine and Helen Lakes, um, and Margaret Lake in the most recent years. And so basically um, what we're doing is removing uh, those um, headwater uh, populations of the non-native trout that we're looking at. So brook trout or rainbow trout or even, even Yellowstone cutthroat trout in, in Catherine Lake, for example. Um, and that with removing those and putting and replacing with uh, pure West Slope cutthroat trout, we're hoping to minimize the impacts of hybridization in those downstream areas. So um, without getting into, you know, the Bow River main stem and, and, um, and, trying to approach it that way. We're sort of doing piecemeal on these headwater lakes um, where we can have impacts and where we can have secure um, populations of West Slope cutthroat trout that should then be able to sort of genetically swamp those hybridized um, main stem areas that are a little trickier to, to get at. Um, so I'll, I'll just leave it there, but there has been a lot of work uh, going on um, in that. And, and Shelly Humphreys, who many of you here probably know, is, is leading that. And I, I work for her for most most of the time. Um, so I, uh, I've been involved with that stuff for, for quite a few years. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Uh, Angela, is there anything you want to add at the more broad level? Yeah. Um, when it comes to like hybridized uh, trout and also like rainbow trout and their impacts on like our native trout populations, I know in places where you have pure West Slope cutthroat trout, where we know where they are, um, typically they are, they've already been isolated by some sort of barrier, like either a natural one, like a waterfall or like a, a natural one, like a set of hanging culverts. Um, if we want, if we want to do any projects uh, uh, to like reconnect habitat or do anything like that, and we know that there's pure West Slope cutthroat trout upstream, we do have to do genetic testing just to make sure that um, the populations that are downstream uh, are not hybridized or would otherwise impact this pure population upstream. So that is something that's being done, like any uh, potential like reconnection or like crossing replacement projects where there are pure West Slope cutthroat trout involved. And as well, maybe Athabasca rainbow trout, I believe you have to do genetic testing to make sure that anything that you do will not impact this population. Great, that, that's great added, added information for sure. Thanks, Angela. So this one is also for, for you, I think, um, Angela. So kind of about rough and loose. So how does a group um, or organization like to you decide where to use the rough and loose technique to restore? Because there are so many multi land use stakeholders, a lot of this is on public land. Um, you know, can you just give us a, a perspective of how you decide and, and how to address that multi land use um, challenge as well? Yeah, so we do a lot of stakeholder consultations before we do any work on the ground. Like, um, for example, we have some work that we're trying to do in Trout Creek, and I think it's like year three of consultation at this point. So we talk a lot with everyone that's involved. We make sure that uh, everyone's on the same page. If we propose rep and loose and some people are skeptical, we try our best just to like explain to them what the process is and like maybe we'll... Um, show them other places where it's worked. And at the end of the day, if uh, some stakeholders don't want rough and loose, uh, we don't do it or we try to do a modified version of it. So we've done things just like pure soil decompaction. So we don't do as extensive of rough and loose. We just kind of fluff up the soil and drop it a bit, which helps with the decompaction issue. We can also do smaller rough and loose where it's a uh, conflict. So not as big of a rough and loose and then combine it maybe with access control measures like um, big boulders placed at front at the front or like um, lots of woody debris scattering on it. 
So yeah, stuff like that. Rough and loose also is appropriate for every region. Like if you're trying to reclaim a trail that's like on a big open plain, um, rough and loose might isn't always the best option because people can easily drive around it. So there's some places where it's suitable and there's some places where it's not. The only way we can find that out is by talking extensively with everyone that would be involved in the project. Great. So yeah, Thank communication you. is basically the answer. Yeah, yeah, because there's, like you said, there's a lot of pieces that need to be considered to, to make, to get to that decision point. So um, kind of following a little bit up on that, but I'd like to pose this to Jerry and Daryl. Um, this is a question um, regarding the trails and the bridges. So how, how does the quad squad manage the trail to the new bridges to reduce sediment transport down the right of way or, or what kind of strategies are involved in the configuration of the trail work you do as you approach the bridge to, to minimize that sediment? Well, we uh, build uh, uh, drainage along the trails that um, if there's any type of slope leading up to the bridge so that uh, the water will run off into the forest instead of uh, down the trail into the streams. Great, Daryl, anything you would like to add to that? I think I think what Gary said is that the, the club has gone in, in in areas where there's been lots of big water holes is draining them off so to get rid of that water so they're not going down into a creek area. So draining them off to the side or putting cross cuts in to eliminate a lot of that. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, maybe this one will go back to um, to Megan. The fish in Maline Lake and Jasper aren't native to the lake. Um, is the Parks Department, in this case the National Parks, looking to change uh, something regarding that? Any any comment, Megan? Uh, at this time, uh, I don't believe there is any plan to um, do any restoration for native trout in Maline Lake. Uh, so I can't uh, say. Okay. Thanks. Um, so um, maybe the next one I'll ask is maybe uh, direct it to Angela. Um, do you know or have you heard anything about um, progress being made towards a code of practice um, or an exemption for working in and near water for restoration work? So um, to make it simpler and easier is kind of the, the idea rather than um, that like, like many other activities have codes of practice and this would be it for restoration type events. Do you want to comment on that Angela? Yeah, um, we've been trying to push this through at TU uh, for the last, I want to say, two or three years, maybe. We've had a meeting with the environment minister to talk about this, and he seemed uh, quite for it, I guess. Uh, they're all about like red tape reduction these days, so that was like a big point, and he seemed to like it. But with a lot of changes in government recently and the upcoming uh, provincial election, I don't know if that's going to be something that you'll you'll see in the next at least year. We're really working hard. We want this as well. We want this as much as you do, but it does, it, it, it is not fully within our control, unfortunately. <laughs> We're trying our best is all I can say. Yeah, absolutely. That Thanks, Angela. I, 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 we, we are on board with that uh, comment as well, or in our work as well. So um, there's lots more questions about um, rough and loose. So I want to maybe just combine a couple um, for you, um, Angela. One of which is, um, is, is this or can this be used to fix other habitat fragmentation that, such as seismic lines and things like that, like non-restoration, the kind of things we've been doing, but also, um, you know, what, what amount of decompaction is required to make it acceptable or appropriate or required? Can you just wrap your answer around both of those kind of concepts? Yeah, um, I feel like it has potential to be used as like a habitat fragmentation fixer upper. <laughs> um, we do use um, rough and loose a lot on seismic lines. That's actually one of like the main features that we end up using it on. Um, but I wouldn't know too much about how it would affect like, or like, how it might affect like say caribou migration or like how if that might scare them off unfortunately i'm not an expert on terrestrial ecosystems um but yeah some potential definitely for sure uh when it comes to like the amount of soil decompaction i don't know if there's like an easily quantifiable way to like quantify decompaction i just kind of go by feel like if you look at touch like a nice hard a hard compacted soil like you're not going to be able to like pick it up with your hand and uh, if you think about like a plant's root system, it's obviously not going to be able to push through that either. So I just kind of like touch, touch the soil with my bare hand. And if I can pick it up and it's nice and fluffy and soft and falls between my fingers, that's, that's pretty prime for me. Great. Thanks. That's a good visual and physical description. 
Um, I want to maybe um, get um, some thoughts on the enforcement aspect. There's a couple different questions, one for the quad squad and, I, and I'll ask Megan to also jump in after, but for um, Daryl and Jerry, what, what are you, I guess, this thought, guys' thoughts on more enforcement um, and being sort of part of the solution um, or or not to to the kind of use and then Megan kind of following up on that in terms of do we need more, you know, higher penalty fines for people using, you know, watercraft that aren't inspected and don't have a permit. So same kind of concept, but is more enforcement or more costly enforcement penalties a, a key or, or a useful tool? Well, I, I think that the uh, um, education is probably the um, best way to uh, get the message across uh, you'd have to hire uh, I don't know how many thousands of people to enforce all the trails that are in the country so it, that enforcement would be very difficult I think what Gary said too is that you know we we have talked about it and in meetings with government uh, there was plans of putting more enforcement in but I think the question we have is that you can put the enforcement in but if you're not going to make the fine where it's worthy for the fine, like a $500 fine or a $200 fine, really doesn't get the message across. But if you happen to end up seizing somebody's ATV because you catch them going through a creek where there's a bridge and there's West Slope Cutthroat, you seize it, they don't get it back. Education comes pretty quick and pretty fast. And really it's maybe it's time to start adding heavier fines in and, and really start hitting some of these people who feel that it's their God-given right to go out and do what they want. And by putting heavier fines in, uh, education will be uh, very quick. I mean, we can, we can advertise all the education to do this, do that. It's, it's time to say, take the bull by the horns and put the enforcement in there. Thanks, guys. Megan, do you want to comment on it from a parks perspective and permitting for watercraft? Yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned, um, this is a relatively new program in Parks Canada. And so we're really taking the opportunity in the first few years to try and focus on that edu education component. Um, it's going to take a while before people recognize and realize um, and are aware of the program. Um, so uh, we want to give people the opportunity um, to be educated, to understand what they need, and then to, to do the right thing. So as we have enforcement um, looking around, um, we can often take the opportunity to, to give them a permit or to direct them to the inspection station. However, um, we have had some occurrences, um, you know, <laughs> repeat offenders, or, or um, and we have had some charges laid um, with the uh, uh, folks not getting their permit up in Waterton Lakes National Park. They've been, um, they've had the program in place for the longest amount of time now. I think it's been about four years since they've. Um, had theirs going. Um, and uh, it is enforceable under the Canada National Parks Act and the maximum penalty under that is $25,000. So not saying that you're going to get a fine $25,000 the first time you go into the park and you don't have your permit and you don't really know where to get it. But, um, you know, if we were to find um, a case where, where it warranted that, that's something that, that could be looked at. So that is the maximum penalty. Right. We really want to focus on the first year on that, first couple of years on that education and allow people the chance to understand the program and, and to gain that awareness. Great. Thanks, Megan. I want to bring Brian in because we haven't had quite as many questions for you. This next question is um, really, did, do, you, do you know or did you test um, any of the differences in mortality between spin casting and fly rod fishing? And wondering if some of the time to reel in and the fight time uh, might affect the mortality. Um, or if you didn't, you know, can you comment on your thoughts on that? No, we didn't. We didn't test the difference, and we did use both methods, but we just standardized. We used fly or spin gear, minimum eight pound on the terminal end, barbless hooks with a gape of um, a minimum ten mils, and that that was about it. And there's there is there is different research on those things, and maybe Angela can even remember last month there was some work out of Idaho on release times, and I think. Contrary to what we sometimes see, the spin anglers were releasing fish faster than the fly anglers on some of their some of their steelhead waters. So, but we didn't test it, but we did use both methods. Yeah. 
There's a kind of a follow up question of so that was kind of different gear, but what about different fish? I know you focused on bull trout or obviously in that test, but do you have any thoughts of how it might be related to other trout species? The, the, the same or different results? Any thoughts? No, I, I, I wouldn't want to hazard a guess at the the kind of resilience to to handling and air exposure. There is quite a bit of literature on um, mortality from air exposure. It tends to be all over the map, depending on the conditions that they expose the fish to and the type of handling. Uh, it would appear that most trout are pretty susceptible to to air exposure within the cell, you know, within within salmonids, some fish are way more resilient to handling largemouth bass, classic example. It's almost the perfect fish for tournament angling. It's just they're so resilient to handling. But trout seem to be seem to be pretty sensitive to it. Great. Th thanks. I appreciate you. You can't make up data that doesn't exist, but it's good to have an understanding of you know work elsewhere. So thank you so much. Yeah, and we also have very, very high catch rates in a number of trout streams, right? The fish are being recycled quite a lot and being right. handled quite a lot. Yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, I think this one um, is maybe, maybe I'll ask uh, Angela to jump in and then um, even Daryl and, and Jerry about volunteer opportunities. Um, so maybe uh, Angela, you could jump in first and talk about sort of just maybe the kinds of things or how people can find out. Um, and um, and then the, from the quad squad perspective, likewise, if you guys want to jump in after Angela. Yeah, sure. Um, we're pretty busy at TU. We have a lot of work coming up this year. Um, in the spring, you can look for, um, from us, we have like a, we updated constantly on our social media and also on our Eventbrite page. Um, but you can look for some spring bioengineering work days that should be coming up soon. Um, I believe in Fish Creek, if you live in Calgary as well, they're also planning on doing their spring red survey. So that's like um, counting how many like fish reds or nests basically are in a certain stretch of the stream. So that's coming up in the spring. Uh, and then in the fall, we usually do another burst of bioengineering as well. So, yeah. Thanks, Angela. And I'll I'll uh, give the last word to Daryl and Jerry about if you guys want to jump in and then we're going to move to our poll. Um, and uh, because it is already 830 and we haven't even touched a quarter of the questions, but um, we'll we'll I'll give it to you guys to answer. And then if people want to stay on, we'll do a few extra questions after our poll. Go ahead, guys. Go ahead, Daryl. Okay. Uh, volunteering, I mean, it's, it's simple. I mean, we find that we put out a, a call for volunteers and we end up with 50 or 60 volunteers. Uh, we volunteer lots uh, when we've done willow planting, you know, with you, Nori, and Cows and Fish. And it, it's a simple call to put an email out to the membership and say, you know, we got this coming up this weekend. If you'd like to come out and volunteer, we're meeting here at nine o'clock. And it's it's absolutely amazing the amount of volunteers we get, including foot when we're installing bridges. Like we end up with so many volunteers just trying to find them a, a job to do. So yeah. overall volunteering is good. Yeah, that's a that's a, a great reminder. So so join these groups and also sign up. Like Angela talked about, just like cows and fish, we have a sign up on our website. So if you want to sign up for volunteer events, check our follow our various groups on social media. I am going to ask um, Logan to uh, share our next and last poll. We will do a few more questions after this, but I, I want to recognize that we said we'd be done at 8:30. So um, please tell us the impact of today's session. Did you learn something, and um, and how will this impact how you interact with native trout and their habitat? This is really important for our funding um, to to talk about how the kind of work we're doing with these native trout workshops is valuable. So or 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 not, and and things that we need to to change or adjust in the future. And um, I'll just um, share my own screen here to uh, to talk a little bit about um, our our funders because we didn't do that yet. And my screen doesn't want to advance, of course. So um, it, maybe it's going to in a moment, hopefully. Um, so I think um, Logan, we can probably close the poll in a few seconds, and um, and then share the results. And I'll just. Uh, 
tell everybody that we really need all the partners at the table to help to put these things on. I really want to thank all of our speakers um, and including those featured in the videos um, that, that make this work possible. It is a, a big task to put these events on and to bring together really great ideas and speakers that, that a large committee of individuals helped uh, find and, and brainstorm about. So thank you so much for the support from the funders for ourselves, particularly that's Department of Fisheries and Oceans, um, Environment and Protected Areas, um, the Alberta Conservation Association, and, um, and each speaker here, of course, is also supported um, from their end as well, both some of them as volunteers and their own funding sources. So um, really want to um, thank everybody for that that time, that effort, and, and we will cover a few more questions. Some of our speakers are able to stay on a couple more minutes. We'll just cover a few more if for those of you that want to stay and um, and uh, and and hear a bit more, and then we'll we'll call it an evening. So we'll just cover a few more talk questions. So let's see what's next on our Q and A list. That's sort of at the top of the list that we haven't covered yet. So um, let's see. Maybe for Brian, um, nope, I, th is, I think Brian had to, to leave. So one of the questions, maybe Angela, you can comment this, how can anglers reduce pressure in popular areas? And how do you know you should be moving along? Any, any kind of thoughts on that? Hmm. I think, I mean, following the regulations is like the easiest way to reduce pressure on population or on popular areas, but yeah, I think, I mean, Brian's back, so maybe he can speak better to this than I can, because I am not an angler, so I, I <laughs> don't have the best knowledge on how to know when to move along. Fair enough. Brian, do you want to jump in? Uh, <laughs> that's a hard question to answer. I was just saying I was here not to answer the question. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, anglers are passionate people and they want opportunities to fish. And so I think having having anglers just use their stewardship ethic and know, you know, maybe it's time to move on or the weather's too hot or I've caught five fish out of this pool. I should probably just move on. You know, like it's been a good time, um, especially with species like bull trout, you know, there's there's some thought that we could treat it like kind of a trophy experience, go on a cool day, fish the bull trout pools, get a nice bull trout and say, hey, man, that was a hell of an experience. What a cool fish. Um, yeah. But again, you know, personal ethics prevail. Um, and it's, yeah, our trout live in beautiful places. As you said, they're the product of beautiful landscapes and it sort of attracts people to go and recreate and fish, so. Yeah. Is, is there a way to avoid catching bull trout? Any, any you know, that's you usually not a problem on, people have, but. Yeah, you catch them on all kinds of methods. You know, even if you dry fly fishing for cutthroat, you will occasionally pick up smaller bull trout as well. And if you're throwing streamers or anything that looks like a bait fish under the surface, I mean, that's what they eat. You know, so and they are so vulnerable to catch. If they see food, there's a good chance they're going to jump on it. Right. Thank you. And I just um, the clar one clarification on the photo release. I think is the idea is that people are take or it's a catch and release approach, but you're taking a photo before you do it. Um, it essentially, is is your photo release, which usually means it's out of the water yep. for however long it takes you to do that. Yeah, it increases air exposure time and handling time to do right. the photo. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Let's see. I'm just going to ask uh, the quad. Uh, uh, let me, there's lots of questions with, with one vote up. So um, I put this out to any of you that want to comment on this because it's kind of a big picture policy question that uh, of that we seem to be maybe 20 years behind places like Ontario in protecting waterways and riparian um, areas erect, uh, next to them. Does anybody want to comment? How, how could we speed up that process or how might we change, um, change those things, um, whether it's through policy or education or enforcement, all the different topics we touched on today or, or, or how we use these places? Does anybody want to throw in a, a comment on that? Uh, I'll say quickly, like, your voice does matter. So if, like, if these issues really matter to you, you'd be surprised what just like writing a very simple letter or email to your MP or minister will accomplish. Like, at the very least, it'll tell them that you have your eye on this issue. Um, and your vote matters too. So if this is an issue that matters to you, try to align your vote to people that will support it. Thanks, Angela. Daryl, did you unmute yourself?
No, I mean, I could be the devil's advocate. Uh, the question comes up is that, you know, how many years have we been trying to do these planning and how many years do we sit in meetings? And it all comes down to the government to either decide and not take 10 years to uh, change something or work on something. I think if you look at what some of the areas in, in that's going down the United States with the uh, Path Hill Metroid trail system, the government said, you have, we have, you have one year to get this plan in place and getting working here. We come back here and we've been talking 15 years on something we're still talking about today. If you look at what Ontario and Quebec have done, and this goes back to the trail passes, in Ontario and Quebec, it's $150 for a trail pass. If you buy a dual pass, which would be ATVs and snowmobiling, you pay 180. That money goes back into developing and paying for, paying for more enforce, enforcement. We've been sitting here talking about enforcement for over 10 years that I know of. And yeah, it's improved a bit, but it hasn't improved where it should be. And I think, you know, we have government offices that you can talk to this level and then it gets to that level and that's where it stops. And I think it's time that, you know, they put time limits on it. And if it's going to be something that can be enforced in a year, then get it working so it's enforced. And I mean, I think that's probably the simplest. Writing our MLAs, I honestly sometimes don't think it's worth talking to your MLAs because you can talk and it's up to them to go back and do something about it. Thanks, Daryl. That's my views. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, I, w if these were all simple questions and simple and simple answers, of course, we wouldn't need to have sessions like this. So I really thank all of our speakers for your perspectives, your time and your energy and your and your commitment and passion to these topics. It's been really great to have you. I think we're going to call it an, an, a night. And thank you so much for everybody who joined us and, and stayed this long as well. Um, the polls show that we, you know, d lots of you did learn something really new tonight and hopefully will change how you interact with Native Trout in the future. You will be receiving an email that has the recordings of both sessions, uh, which you can share with anybody else, of course. And, um, and if you didn't you know, get catch everything or you want to rewatch it, of course, feel free. Um, it will be on YouTube and also we'll, of course, announce the prizes via email to those folks that were selected in the draw after the fact. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining us, for my co-host team, uh, Logan and Amy, for making all the background pieces work as well. And um, have a great night, everybody. Thanks for joining us.